Wanted to make sure they weren't going to give us an encore before I came up here. <laughs> All right, if you've got your copy of God's Word, let me invite you to open it to the book of Acts. If you've been here and you've been walking with us through the, uh, since the beginning of the year, you know that uh, we're just getting into, um, on Sunday mornings, what we're calling our Covenant Connect class. And our, our Covenant Connect class is essentially a new members class. It's going to meet, generally speaking, during the Sunday school hour for anyone who's interested in joining our church. Um, it's going to be about a four-week class. And then we're going to have a fifth week where uh, we bring in the rest of the staff. They get a chance to ask any questions about Covenant and just really get to uh, make sure that Covenant is a place that, uh, that they want to call home. And the reason that we're doing this is because there's a, there's a lot of confusion sometimes about what it takes to join a, a local Baptist church. I remember I was pastor in this church. Uh, the Spirit of God was moving, and a family came down to join. They were coming from a, a church that was across town that was going through some tough times, uh, and they really felt like the church that, that we were at was where they wanted their family to be. And so I just let the church know that uh, this family had already made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. That means that they had already repented of their sins, expressed faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and uh, believe in the resurrection. And so they had been baptized by immersion, and I let the people know in the church that they were coming by transfer of letter. Uh, now, if I'm going to ask you, if, if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, what this transfer of letter is, slip your hand up real quick. All right. One young lady is one of the only ones that aren't lying, and one young man. All right, so there are some, uh, I was going to say, if you know what I'm talking about, raise your hand, but I figured then everybody would just raise their hand. Anyways, and so after that, uh, there was a couple, maybe about six months later, there was this really sweet couple from the Philippines that we had become really good friends with, and uh, she came to me, and she said, Pastor, she said, I've been wanting to join the church for six months, she said, but I don't know how to get that letter you've been talking about, and uh <laughs> And so we, we laugh at that, but there's somebody who wants to, to join fellowship with the local body of Christ. Uh, there's just confusion surrounding it. And so what, what we're going to be doing is we're, gonna, we're just going to say, hey, this Covenant Connect class is a, a conveyor belt that if you're interested in joining our class, we, uh, interested in joining our church, we want you to come to this Sunday school class. We'll talk for about four weeks, share with you some things about covenant, share with you some kind of entry-level things that we feel like you should know as a believer. And then uh, hopefully at the end of the class, everyone will, will still be interested in joining Fellowship with Covenant, and then everybody can kind of join together. Because there's another awkward part about joining a Baptist church, and that is if you come by yourself, the pastor's going to say, Everyone in, in, uh, in, uh, in agreement with letting this brother join fellowship with us say amen. There's that quarter second where you're like, please let him say yes. Please let him say yes. Any of you been there? Some of you has been so long since you joined a Baptist church, you've forgotten what it's like to walk in front of a bunch of strangers and hope that they welcome you with open arms. And so hopefully this uh, Covenant Connect class can get all of this information out in front for people. And also, um, as members of Covenant, everybody who's joined Covenant in the last 25 years, which is forever for Covenant, uh, has signed one of these church covenants. And we want to make sure that you, if you're interested in joining Covenant, have an opportunity to read it before we put it in front of you and ask you to sign it after we've already said, yes, come on, be a, be a member of Covenant. So that's just a couple of um, examples of uh, why we're going to be doing some things that we're doing. Uh, and so hopefully now you're over in the book of Acts, and we're going to walk through uh, somewhat preaching style because it's a Sunday morning, but we're going to walk through some of the information that we believe is really important for people to have before they join fellowship with Covenant. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get into the book of Acts chapter 1. Lord, we come before you now, and we are so grateful that you have overcome as the song sang. Lord, we recognize that before we met you, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Lord, we were hopeless. We were weighed down with um, just the burden of sin. And then someone, somehow, we were introduced to you. We put our faith in you as the Son of God. You forgave us of our sins. You cleansed us of all unrighteousness. And Lord, then you gave us the gift of the local church to do life with. And so, Lord, we're grateful for this church, this body. And Lord, I pray now that as we uh, talk more about the local church, that we would each be encouraged, that we would see this entity the way that you ordained it to be. And Father, I pray that if we find ourselves falling short, that we would shape up. 
And I pray that if we find ourselves doing well, that we would celebrate together. So God, we pray now that you would, through your word, feed your people. Lord, I pray that you would use me to do that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hopefully you're in the book of Acts. Uh, We're going to start in chapter 1. But I'm going to give you a brief review to catch you up uh, to where we are in the book of Acts. So we're going to start in Genesis, and in about 60 seconds, I'm going to get you up to the book of Acts. You ready? I know I already talk fast to some of you, but I'm, I'm, I thought about this to make sure I talk slower so everybody can pick it up. But I still want to get you out in time for lunch. So here we go. So you're not worried about going to lunch? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. God saw that everything he had made was good. He rests on the seventh day. Throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament, you can find that the people of God have always been a people of faith, right? There's, there's, there's one group of people, the Israelites, the nation of Israel, that, is, that, is, that looks special in the Old Testament, but God's true people have always been a people of faith. That's in the book of Romans. And so from Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham, that people of faith, the nation of Israel, has drifted farther and farther away from God. So they look the opposite of most of your retirement counts. Usually we like a little plateau, you have a little decline, and hopefully there's a mountain that you climb. Well, the people of God have the, the opposite look. They've generally been going further and further away from God. Now they have some, some peaks in there, but generally God's people have been falling further and further away from him. Now you fast forward to Jesus. Jesus comes to earth. He models what we're supposed to have in our relationship with God. And so Jesus shows us the way that we're supposed to live. And then uh, once Jesus comes, he picks 12 ordinary people to do life with. We call them the, the 12 disciples. And we find these 12 ordinary people don't always understand Jesus and what he's doing. Right? Jesus will explain something. They'll come to him kind of in secret and go, Jesus... Um, that, that didn't make any sense. Uh, can you explain that to us? And so Jesus is patient with these 12 individuals, and you find that over time, these 12 individuals begin to understand a little bit more of what Jesus is doing in the world. And so Jesus is preaching to this group of people, and he says some really difficult things, and everybody leaves. Jesus looks at his 12 followers, and he says, are you guys going to leave too? And they say, where else would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And you find that these guys are realizing who and what Jesus is about, even if the things he says are difficult. So Jesus is uh, preaching again, and he looks at his followers, that, those 12 disciples, and he says, who do the people say I am? And they say, some say Elijah, some say Moses, some say the prophets. And then Jesus looks at him, he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, all right, you get it now. So these people are beginning to understand what Jesus is about. Jesus gets to the the end of his life, and he's having the Last Supper with his 12 disciples. And he says, listen, I'm about to leave you. I'm going to go somewhere where you can't go. And he says, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the helper. And we know that helper to be the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He says, I'm going to leave you the helper, and you're going to do even greater things than you saw me do. So if you're reading through the Bible now, you're like, whoa, time out. What is going on with this helper? And if you've been reading through the Gospels and all the miracles that Jesus has been doing, you're think, your mind is blown. You're like, wow, how can we do greater things than Jesus himself was going to do? So Jesus lays down his life for the forgiveness of sins for all who will believe. He raises from the dead. He shows himself to those 12 disciples and four or 500 other people. And he tells his disciples, wait. He says, don't go anywhere yet. Wait in Jerusalem. This is all taking place in, uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Wait in Jerusalem for something to happen. And that's where we're going to pick up in the book of Acts. This is Acts chapter 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, all about Jesus, all, excuse me, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait what the Father had promised. Which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, 
It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And so Jesus has died on the cross for our sins. He's risen from the dead, and he comes back to his disciples, and he says, don't go anywhere just yet. And so you find that the first command given to the local church, if you will, is to wait. Don't go into the world and try to do this thing on your own. You following me? And so we can translate this to, if you're at Covenant Baptist Church and you're doing anything on your own, you're doing it wrong. Right? If what you're doing isn't equipped and enabled by the Holy Spirit, you're, you're missing the mark of what Jesus has commanded us to do. Also, what I want you to see is that this church is made up of people who believe firmly that Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead. Amen? And so this is a group of people who are crazy from the get-go, right? Right? You ever been witnessing to somebody and things are going great, and then you tell them that you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and they look at you like you've lost your mind? And I just gladly tell them, yes, I have. It is putting my faith in Jesus Christ raising from the dead is the greatest thing I've ever done. And it radically changed my life more than anything else I've ever done. And so I'm, I'm joyfully crazy in your sight. But I just want you to know that this is something that sets us, the local church, apart from the rest of the world. Is that our hope is not in some grand teaching by some guy who's dead and gone. But our hope is in the teaching and the life and the sacrifice of someone who died for us and then rose from the dead. Amen? That's where our hope is, so that sets us apart. And then we don't just go out and do things on our own, but we do things in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what is it that is our mission given by the risen Jesus Christ? And what is the purpose of that Holy Spirit working in our life first given? See, the Holy Spirit's come upon you. He's going to give you power. And you're going to be what? You're going to be great cookers of potluck meals. You're going to be great yard sale attendees. You're going to do all of these fundraising things? He says, no. The purpose of you getting the Holy Spirit is so that you can be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the Holy Spirit has been given to you, local church, if you've put your faith in Jesus, been forgiven of your sins. The Holy Spirit has been given to you primarily so that you can be witnesses and testifiers to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No one in your life no one in the world can be saved apart from professing faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and in his resurrection. And that is absolutely absurd if you're going about it by yourself. Like, do you really think that you can convince someone that God became a man, took on flesh, dwelt among us, and then died for our sins and then rose from the dead? Do you think that you can really convince anyone of that on your own apart from the Holy Spirit of God working in their life? Right? I have met people who thought I was an absolute nut job for believing that, and I have met people who have wept and cried because the Holy Spirit of God was working in their life, and they needed that for salvation. And so I just want to share with you that there are no winsome words that can be spoken to win people to Jesus. It's only the power given to you by the Holy Spirit that can lead people to Jesus. And we, if we're going to be the church that, that God wants us to be as Covenant Baptist Church, we have to be reliant on the Holy Spirit to do his job, and we have to be faithful to do our jobs. All right, so we keep going through the book of Acts, and we're going to fast forward a little bit through Acts over to chapter 2. Go ahead to verse 37 of chapter 2. And you can find out more about the local church there. So the Holy Spirit has just descended upon those 12. They begin to preach. They begin to preach in ways that they have not preached before. Peter's just come off the heels of denying Christ three times before the rooster crows, remember? And then he's going to stand up in front of thousands of people, and he's going to share Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of David, risen from the dead, salvation in no one else other than him. And by the way, Jewish people, you're the ones who killed him, right? This is the sermon that he's getting ready to preach. And listen to how that goes, right? Can you imagine hearing that sermon as the very first sermon? Like as you flip through YouTube and palatable sermons for people to hear for the first time ever. Is Peter's sermon one that you would choose? This is who Jesus is. This is who Jesus was. This is what he did. And by the way, his blood is on your hands, you filthy sinners. That's his message. And how does it go, right? If you're doing this apart from the Holy Spirit, you're looking at, at, at jail time. If you do this with the Holy Spirit, go down to verse 37 of chapter 2. 
It says this, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? You see this? You ever presented someone's sin to them? Right, not in an ugly way, like you're caught up in sin, your life is terrible, you're a wreck, you're never going to amount to anything, nothing like that. But have you ever lovingly put your arm around someone and just shared with them that the lifestyle they're living is, is really not pleasing to God and that there's a better way through faith and forgiveness in Jesus? Right, that conversation usually goes one of two ways. One way is the person gets mad at you and leaves and never wants to see you again because you don't like them. The other thing that happens is that the person will be cut to the heart exactly like it's described here, and they want to repent because they love Jesus and they want to please him. Like those are two things that usually happen. Usually it's anger or it's, it's faith and repentance. And so here these people are cut to the heart. What do we do? Peter, we agree with what you said. We killed the Holy One of God. Peter says to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And church, if we're going to be the local church that Jesus has called us to be, our mission has to be about sharing with people in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, who Jesus is, explaining to them that their sin has separated them from God, caused God to grieve, and then call them to repentance and faith. That's what the mission of the local church is all about. And so the local church is all about showing people their sinful ways in love, showing them that Jesus loves them, has a plan for their life, has offered them forgiveness, and that forgiveness is given to those who repent and believe. And so, brothers and sisters, we can't water this message down at all as a church. It has to be about that. And that seems to be, as you read all through the scriptures, where the Holy Spirit shows up and shows out in people's lives calling people to faith and repentance. So that means that not just on Sunday mornings will we do that, but that means that as an individual believer at Covenant Baptist Church, that your life will be about that at work, at home, at play, wherever that is, and your life will be about sharing Jesus with people, dependent upon the Holy Spirit for them to make the right decision. So we keep going. 39. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself... And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were about 3,000 souls added. 3,000 souls added. Based on that message that Peter just gave. And I'd encourage you to go home and read the message that Peter gave and see how that jives with maybe your favorite pastor and the gospel that he preaches. And I would make sure that I understood that the Holy Spirit was behind this one and all of these people getting saved. And so now you have these people who have professed faith in Jesus. So they've repented, they've believed, and they've been baptized. And now you have the makings for the local church, right? So now the church went from the 12 apostles and the roughly 70 people who are following Jesus during his lifetime. Now there's about 3,070, right? And if you have any sort of shepherd's heart about you, you're going, wow, this is borderline nightmare, right? So I'm excited in the moment, but what in the world are we going to do with 3,000 new people, right? How are we going to help them grow spiritually? What are we going to begin to do? And so this is what they begin to do. Chapter 2, verse 42. It says this, they were, this is all of the people who had repented and believed and been baptized. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so these are the, I call them the, the magic silver bullets, if you will, of what the early church was devoted to. And I want you to think about our church services that we offer, and I want you to look at them in light of what this early church was devoted to. They were continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so I'm not an apostle. Uh, Tracy's not an apostle. JB's not an apostle. Carson's not an apostle. But we have the apostles' teaching right here, right? And so we're devoted to this teaching. You've showed up this morning, and the, the primary focus of what we're going to do here this morning is that we lift up our voices in unison to worship the Lord, and we're devoted to the teaching of God's Word. If we ceased opening this book when I was preaching many of you would find somewhere else to go because this is, this is who we want to hear from this morning. Amen? 
We want to hear from God. If we don't really care what, what Bobby and his, his fishing stories, right? We want to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying through his word to us. And so they're continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So if you're here, go ahead and give yourself one gold star, right? You need four in order to, to measure up here. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And so these individuals are not just devoting themselves to a set-apart time to learn from the apostles, but they're invested in fellowshipping with one another. That's why we plan things as a church that, that look fun, so that you can come together and fellowship with one another. That's why our Salty Sweet Sisterhood planned a scavenger hunt to get old people and young people in the same car doing fun things together. Fellowship. If you want to reach a younger generation, you're not going to do it apart from having fun with them. Look at our economy. Millennials, younger folks, are not buying houses at the rate that you older folks bought houses. Right? And I'm, I'm lumping myself in there as just barely meeting the older folk mark, okay? We all, we all buy, buy houses. Most of our younger folks are not buying houses. Where are they spending all of their money? If you look at where younger people are spending their money, it's on experiences, not things. You want to get involved in a younger person's life? Go experience something with them. Go have fun with them. Go skydiving with them. Go rock climbing with them, right? Go do something that they value and treasure as fun. Then, while you're having fun with them, you'll be able to speak truth into their life as you're building these relationships, right? And so now you can justify skydiving because the pastor said it, right? Right? Just take a young person with you. All right, so they're continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They're fellowshipping with one another. They're devoted to the breaking of bread. What do we do on Wednesday nights before we have our Wednesday night prayer meeting? We eat together. Now, I don't want anyone to be offended at this. You need to hear exactly what I'm saying with the right heart. You ready for this? Cleaver's braced himself. Ready? Here it comes. If you're not working, we as Covenant Baptist Church expect you to show up and eat with us on Wednesday night. Why? Because something special happens when you break bread with people. Something special happens at the dinner table. I don't understand it completely, but I can look at my kids in the eye and ask them things over dinner that I can't normally ask other times. When you sit down at the dinner table with somebody, that locks you together in a special and intimate way with their life. And so Covenant Baptist Church, we eat dinner together on Wednesday nights at 5 o'clock. I understand that some of you are working. I understand that some of you have excuses. But I also want you to understand that I think a lot of excuses are rubbish, right? So the excuse could be this. I don't like the food. It's not about the food. It's about breaking bread together and finding intimate relationships with one another. If you don't like the food, bring your own food right? That's, that's not offensive. Uh, there's a lady named Miss Janice. She cooks for anybody who signs up. If you bring a Bojangles uh, chicken snack in with you, she is not offended in the slightest, right? She, she does church hospitality for us, and she's responsible for cooking meals for whoever signs up for the meals. If you show up with Chick-fil-A every morning, or excuse me, every Wednesday evening, I will high-five you as you come in the door, and I'll just eat whatever Janice fixes. If you come on Wednesday nights, listen very closely. The expectation is not that you sit with the same people every Wednesday night. There's an expectation that you mix it up and you get to meet new people and you build these relationships through fellowship during this time that we've set apart. So you, can't, you get off work at 5. Show up here at 5.15. You can't get here by 5.15? Show up at 5.30. The point is, is that you somehow get your behind in a seat next to someone else and enjoy breaking bread together with them. You following me? So, so none of this is about you or food, really, right? Because you can bring your own food. The point is that when we eat and we fellowship together, we're building relationships that matter. When do you look into someone's eyes and ask them the hard questions? It's only after you've spent time with them. You get to know them. I've gotten to meet a lot of you guys during Wednesday night suppers. I come to your table. I sit with you. I hear your story. I hear how you met your wife, kind of got a, some questions that I like to go through and ask just to get to know people, and most of you, that happen on Wednesday nights, whether you realize it or not. Why? Because Wednesday nights are purposeful. And then what else do we do on Wednesday nights? Here's the fourth gold star. They dedicated themselves to prayer. 
So the early church was dedicated to the apostles' teaching. They're going to fellowship together. They're going to break bread together, and they're going to pray together. And just to kind of throw this out there by way of observation, I've never had anybody come to my office who's really struggling through a difficult time in their life and stays that way a long time who's dedicated to these four things. People who are dedicated to the teaching of God's word, they're showing up at Bible studies, they're committed to getting into God's word. It doesn't really matter who the teacher is because anytime someone's opening up God's word, you can get something from God. Right, So it doesn't have to be this winsome teacher that's always teaching. You be dedicated to God's word. You be dedicated to fellowship. You be dedicated to breaking bread with each other. Get people over your house to eat. If you have to order takeout from the wagon wheel, who cares? Get people to your house to eat. The local church is committed to one another in this passage. And I want you to see the results of this. So they're not just teaching, they're not just fellowshipping, they're not just breaking bread, and they're not just praying together, but look at verse 43. When they did all of those things, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. And they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So we live in the most connected world that's ever existed through the internet. Through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all of these apps. The world is more connected than it's ever been, and people are lonelier than they've ever been in the midst of that. What your friends and family want is for somebody to put their arm around them, share Jesus with them, and invite them to a meal where they sit down face to face. That's what the world is yearning for. Love, acceptance, a place where they fit. I've told you before, if you could find a way to make your church a place where people fit and feel welcome, you won't be able to beat people away. Because the reality is that most of us don't fit anywhere but the local church. That's the place where we should feel love and acceptance from God's people. And so the the outcome of this is that all of these people are loving each other. And look at this, verse, verse 45. They're selling property and possessions, and they're sharing with anyone who might have need. If I just stand up here and announce to you that, that, that uh, uh, John Doe has a need, that doesn't mean as much to you unless you really value and trust me as it does when you eat dinner with John Doe and hear his story. So if I stand up here and tell you that John Doe is is having trouble with this and needs money for X, Y, or Z, you might look at John Doe and look at his car, look at his recent purchases, and look at his lifestyle, and you might not understand why he has that need, but if you sat down with him at dinner and you understood who he was and what he was about, then you would understand the need that he has in his life. This is an opportunity for us to cry with one another, for us to celebrate with one another, just as 1 Corinthians is going to tell us about. And so here we have, in our church covenant, uh, it lists a few of these things. And so I'm going to read, next week I'll have a copy of this uh, for all of you on your seats. But the church covenant reads like this, and I'm really only going to cover the first three bullet points today. We as members of Covenant Baptist Church affirm that we're God's people, led by His Spirit to enter into covenant with Him and one another. We pledge to commit ourselves to a joyous and obedient walk of faith as one body in Jesus Christ. And so your commitment when you join Covenant Baptist Church is to a joyful and obedient walk with Jesus, right? So there's no sad Susans, right? Right? This is, we're joyfully following Jesus. We've gladly repented of our sin. He's gladly forgiven us of all unrighteousness. And now we as believers, we couldn't be more excited because we deserved hell and eternal damnation. And instead, he gave us forgiveness and eternal life, right? And there's something to be joyful about. And so we are people who are joyfully obedient to walk as Jesus walked together. And then the last sentence is, we believe that in making our covenant with God, we are agreeing to please him in all respects, trusting in the promise of his love. And so this means that when you commit to being a Christ follower and a member of Covenant Baptist Church, your whole life is on the table, right? Because we're looking to please him in all respects. So when you want to join Covenant Baptist Church, there are no more secret compartments in your life, right? Everything is laid bare before God and everything is on the table. 
And so now we get into the bullet points. So as grateful testimony to that trust, we will, and this walks through the commitments that you're making as a member of Covenant Baptist Church. And can't you see why this is a good thing to let someone know on the front end, right? If, so if, if 10 people walk through this covenant class, right, and five of them go, whoa, whoa, I didn't realize I was getting into that. That's okay. That's okay. How does the, how does the Marine Corps recruit people? You show up, for 12 weeks we'll try to kill you. If you survive, then you get to be one of us, right? <laughs> and does the Marine Corps have any problem being successful in anything they put their hand to? And the answer is no, they don't. Why? Because people know the expectations and they live up to them. And our goal here at Covenant Baptist Church is that people understand God's word. We're not taking any of these things out of context of God's word. They all match beautifully with what Jesus said. Jesus says, uh, unless you pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me, uh, you're, not, you're not worthy of me. He who puts his head to the plow and turns back isn't worthy of following me. And so these are just putting into some, some ways that we can understand the expectations that God has for us. And so here's the, one of the bullet points. Seek God's will. So as grateful testimony to that trust, we will seek God's will in our lives, realizing that every decision requires us to step forward in faith with steadfast prayer sustaining us. You all know that Ephesians 2.10 is one of my favorite verses. It says this, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. And so here's the great part about, about being a part of the local church. So you know that if you've been here any length of time, we have some, some retired missionaries here at church. My family, uh, actually my in-laws, were praying about starting this ministry. They were looking to, to rent this particular house, and there were some financial things that may have been holding them back. A missionary couple comes up to me that's retired, puts their arm around me and says, hey, what's taking your family so long in renting that house? If they believe that God has told them that's where they're supposed to live, why don't they just step out in faith and make the decision? To which I high-fived them. I was like, yes! That is what we want from our older generation, right? Like, if you're here and you've been walking with Jesus a long time, the little faithful things that somebody who's just come to Jesus in aren't a big deal to you. Why? Because you've been walking with Jesus and you've been taking that next step of faith, next step of faith, next step of faith, and following Jesus isn't a big deal to you. Why? Because you've seen his faithfulness time and time and time again. And you can put your arm around that young Christian and say, listen, it's okay to give up X, Y, and Z because Jesus is going to fill that void with something greater. Right? You can put down the alcohol because God's going to fill it with something way better in your life. Right? And you know this to be true because you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. And it ought not to be this, this little elite group of people. It ought to be all of our people who have been walking with Jesus. Why? Because they're continually seeking God's will for their lives, realizing that every decision requires us to step forward in faith with steadfast prayer sustaining us. And so that means that if you're coasting in your life, you're not living up to the church covenant that you signed. Because we're always supposed to be gaining, ga gaining ground on darkness. So number two, minister to one another's needs, having been knit together in love, which is our perfect bond. If you've, if you've ever read through 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you know that we all have different gifts. We're all separate members, but we make up one body, the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians is going to tell you that when, when one part of the body is not functioning the way that it should, it hurts the body. And so you realize that if you're here and you're a part of Covenant Baptist Church, that you are a vital part of this church, and it's paramount that you work and function in such a way to build up the rest of the body. Then, number three, is assemble ourselves, and this is the last one. I'm going to lump these last two together. Assemble ourselves faithfully for worship and warmly welcome others into our fellowship. And so what I want you to see mainly from those last two that I listed is that our church is here for you, but it's not about you. Our church is here for me, but it's not about me. Our church is, is designed with all of us as different parts of the body so that we can, what? So that we can bear witness to the resurrection to the rest of the world. And so church is not a commodity that you use and you come back for each week. 
Church is a family that you're a part of where you're always looking outside serving others. And so I'm going to just read those last two again. Minister to one another's needs, having been knit together in love, which is our perfect bond, and then assemble ourselves faithfully for worship and warmly welcome others into our fellowship. And so there's two things in that last one. One is that we're always going to be about welcoming others into our fellowship. Right? Right? I love this about covenant. We follow up with just about every visitor that comes to our church. If they fill out a visitor card, we always follow up with them. And then we also try to track them down better than the FBI if they don't fill out a visitor card, right? We try, right? Facebook is a, is a great machine sometimes. And so we try to follow up with everyone. And do you know what, what the majority, if not every single person says? They compliment you all on how hospitable you are. And I love that about our church. I don't want to pastor a church that visitors feel neglected, right? I like pastoring a church where visitors feel home their very first visit. And I think this is one of those things that, that you can pat yourself on the back for. I just want to say, keep up the good work. And so, assemble ourselves faithful for worship, welcome others into our fellowship. And this is a big one this day and age. Assemble ourselves faithfully for worship. When most of you were kids, if you're 40, 50, 60, and above, if you were considered faithful to church, you went three times a week, right, when you were growing up. You came Sunday morning, you came Sunday night, and you came Wednesday night. The statistic has changed, and now the statistic is faithful church members come three times a month, to which I would say that's a tragedy. Do I expect you to be here every time the doors are open? A little, but <laughs> just being honest. But do I expect to you, for you to be at everything that you can possibly get to that our church plans for the corporate body? And the answer is yes. I do. I really do. If you're working, I understand. Do I think that some people should make sacrifices with their vocation so that they can meet with the family of God? Yes, I do. Are there exceptions to all of these things? Yes. So don't leave here mad thinking, oh, the pastor thinks I should quit my job and do something else. I'm not saying that. What I'm telling you is I think that Jesus and the local church are worth making sacrifices for. And I just read a fantastic article online. The article was titled, Church is the Excuse that You Should Miss Everything Else For. And that struck a chord right here. I'm going to tell you that, um, this, I'm going to brag a little bit, but I know of a young man in our church who made a high school team for the first time ever and told the coach that he had to be gone by 6 o'clock on Wednesdays because of church. And to that young man, almost made a tear run down my eye and wanted to high-five the kid. Isn't that fantastic? Is, is that possible for everybody? I understand that there are circumstances where that, that may not be possible. I understand that there may be circumstances where you're trying to reach Jesus outside of the walls. You're trying to reach people for Jesus outside of the walls of the church. And you're being very purposeful in doing that. I get that there's all sorts of exceptions. What I'm getting at is that our church covenant says that we're, that we're going to assemble faithfully. And if we're going to be honest and diehard followers of Christ who are picking up our cross and following him, we need to figure out what faithfully means to us. And is it something that we want to do haphazardly or is it something that we want to be committed to? And I just partial, I'm just partial to thinking it should be something that we should be committed to. So, there's some places where I think that we excel, and there may be some places where we could, we could stand to, to tighten up. You have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. We don't read your mail. We don't read, we don't read your emails, right? You don't look, like, convinced of that. We want you to follow Jesus and follow the Holy Spirit in your life. But if you're a part of covenant, you, you signed off on this. And so we want you to, uh, we want you to keep your word. And we want you to just remember that this was a covenant that you made before God, not just to another human being. And so I want, just wanted to throw that out there. This is something we want everybody that, that comes to covenant to know about beforehand. And so I want to go to the Lord in prayer. If you're here and you, you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, if you've never repented of your sin, put your faith in him to forgive you, to give you eternal life. If you're here and you've never confessed that Jesus rose from the dead, and you cannot be saved. And I want to invite you to do that today. If you're here and you say, man, I like the stuff that he's got on that paper, and I want to join Covenant Baptist Church, 
in four weeks, we're going to invite a whole group of people uh, to join Covenant together. We've got two families uh, and an individual kind of in the chute that are waiting to join. Uh, and if you'd like to be a part of that also, uh, we'd like to ask you to kind of wait until then to do that. But let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the gift of the local church. And God, I pray that we can just continually to meet faithfully. Pray that we continue to be devoted to your word. I pray that we can continue to be devoted to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And God, I pray that uh, Lancaster as a whole would just be in awe of what you're doing through us. And so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would move in a mighty way so that we can be witnesses of the resurrection in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And Lord, last of all, I pray that if there's anyone here who's never put their faith in you to forgive them of their sins, Lord, I pray today would be the day they make that decision. It's in Jesus' name we pray.